Today on Twin Cam, we are with Melody for what is hopefully the final in garage episode of this gearbox rebuild saga that has taken me months and months and months because motivation. Now I've realised over the you know past few times I've been out in a garage that I've just recorded this as big one big long stream of consciousness and that's not really going to work in YouTube land so I'll have to have split it up by the time you've seen it into bite sized chunks so this is a proper introduction for what is possibly only the second or third time in this series so here we are You'll have seen last time we got the car actually started, she runs, and I don't know whether I did film this bit or not, but she moves forwards and backwards. I put her in first gear and she moves forwards, and I put her in reverse, and she moves backwards. So that's all well and good. However, there are a couple of little teething troubles. Again, I've not had this car actually out on the road. She doesn't have an MOT now because that expired. Um, but there are just a few things that I've noticed, and that's what we're going to go through today. Starting with something you'll already be able to see, and that's the cooling system. So, all I've done is put the cooling system on and filled it up with water, and I've not shown you it because it is literally me putting some pipes on and putting a radiator in, and that's not very interesting because you saw it all in the first episode, so, uh, well, they're taking a part of it anyway. So, I've had to use new Jubilee clips because a lot of them, the original ones, weren't reusable, so it's had a few new clips. Uh, it's had a new radiator mounting rubber at the bottom because one of them was, re was torn totally. Um, and it's been filled up with coolant, and I've ran the car up, and it works. There are no leaks. I've not got it up to full temperature yet, but there are no leaks. It pumps coolant round. We're good. The only thing that's really noteworthy on the cooling system side is the J-shaped pipe at the bottom down there. So I'll put a picture on the screen, and obviously that's brand new. It's made out of stainless steel, and that's something people in the Metro Owners Club have made. Uh, or had made, should I say, in a big batch, because the original ones are not available anymore and they were mild steel. And when you shove mild steel at the bottom of an engine bay in pipe form and then have water flowing through it in cars that don't have the correct coolant maintained all the time, they rot and you get holes in them. And then you get events like this. Yeah. Get some more microphone. That was indeed my friend's MG Metro after we pulled up at the NEC in no yeah, November 2022 and um, it was absolutely fine all the way down and then we got to the NEC, got a little bit too hot, a little bit too much pressure in the system and there was a tiny, tiny pinhole in the J-pipe and coolant goes everywhere because it's under pressure and very hot. So that's why these things are being made again and it's wonderful to have a car that has such great support behind it. I mean, there aren't a huge number of people that are into metros, but you've got people who love them enough to make things like that, and I'm one of the people who's bought one of those pipes. So that's lovely, and it future-proofs Melody's cooling system. Um, so apart from the cooling system, you'll notice as well that I have the battery tray off, and that's because there's something wrong with the clutch. As I have said, the car does move backwards and forwards, so it does work generally, but there's something wrong with the adjustment. So here is the end of the clutch cable, and it goes on this arm here, and then it pushes in. There's a release bearing underneath the cover here, and it, you know, actuates the clutch. But the cable itself is meant to be self-adjusting. It's meant to be automatic. You put it on, it adjusts itself. That's fine. But it isn't. There's only, like, that much travel in the clutch pedal. If you put your foot behind the clutch pedal and then move your foot up, there's a load of travel that isn't being used, and that's not how she was before I did this. So clearly there's something up with the cable, and in fact, if you go up to the top of the clutch cable, which you won't be able to see on camera, you can actually pull the clutch cable about five or six millimetres out of the bulkhead. There is clearly something going on with the way this clutch is adjusted, and it's not quite actuating properly. Again, it works, but when I get it out on the road, the chances are it might not fully engage or disengage. So um, we're doing some adjustments here, and the thing you can adjust is the throwout, which is controlled by this bolt here on the end. So I'm following Mr. Haynes' instructions here, and it says, and I quote, unscrew the throwout stop and lock nuts from the end of the th to the end of the thread. So that's what I've done there. There is the adjuster one, and that is the lock nut on the end. So there, all the way to the end of the thread. And then pull the release lever out away from the clutch cover by hand until you can feel the release bearing make contact with the thrust sleeve. 
So the release bearing is on the other side of this cover here. Um, the, um, we installed a new one actually, but I didn't film it because Connor just kind of did it in 10 seconds and I had no chance of filming it. So I don't think I mentioned it in the video, but it's had a new release bearing. And it does actually say, according to Austin Rover, that whenever you do any new clutch componentry, you need to adjust this. So it's had a new release bearing and it's had, of course, a new clutch itself. So yeah, I need to adjust this. And with the clutch cable out of the way, and that screwed out all the way, I should say as well, and you see, there is that bit of travel there in the release lever. So I'm going to guess that to make this, the release bearing engage with the thrust on the end, which is a little metal cover we put on the end of the flywheel bolts, I'm going to guess you do that. And that's it. So you're pushing the lever away, which means you're pushing the release bearing in. So I suppose that's correct. And then I need um, to screw this the actual adjuster in, so the gap between there and there is six and a half millimetres, so I'll do that now. That measurement now is bob on, and I don't have a rule, um, so I, um, <laughs> I cut up a little ruler. How accurate that actually is for something like six and a half millimetres, I don't know, but it's there or thereabouts. This is an A-series after all. Um, so that is now correct, that measurement. I took the lock nut off the end because, well, um, it's easier to get the spanner on. Um, and this is 24 millimetres, which is a strange size, um, but I do have it, fortunately. So, um, so there we are. What I will say is just, you know, a bit of advice is um, when I first started on doing it, the lock nut, which is this, and the actual throw out bolt itself, um, were moving together. It took ages and ages of moving them back and forth, loads of WD-40 to get them to unstick. But now they are unstuck, so I can do it. So if you do run into that issue, then it's just like mine. So now I'm going to be very careful and try to keep that adjustment the same while I thread this back on. That is now tight. There's no torque setting given, so tight will do. So now I will hook up the clutch cable again, hopefully. Well, that turned into one of the biggest faffs I've ever encountered, and thank God it's over. I don't know why, but once I had adjusted up the correct gap and tightened the lock nut, I could not correct uh, connect the clutch cable to the end of the arm here. Um, the more I messed with it, the more it adjusted its way up here, um, and I just couldn't release it. When I put the engine in, I had, while the engine was out, I accidentally pressed the clutch pedal, which just adjusted this all the way up to there, as if I had a massively worn clutch. Uh, but it just kind of, the cable just came out, and it went back down to here. Um, but this time, it took me an absolute age, and yes, I did disconnect this. The way you're meant to do it is, this bracket that holds the clutch cable on, it braces it against the transmission casing. And to have that bolted on, although I've, I've loosened it, I still need to tighten it actually. But I loosened it just to give it a little bit of wiggle room. And then disconnect this C-clip up here um, on the end of this spring cable. Um, and then it adjusts up within the spring. Um, so it kind of goes inside itself and adjusts. And with all the force behind it in the world, it did finally unadjust, and I managed to get the pin in the end, and oh, so much faff, so much faff. So I'm now going to just tighten this up, and then we will press the clutch pedal and see how it feels. After all that faff, totally unnecessary faff, I must add, I really hope it works, because if it doesn't, then I've wasted a load of time here, but you know. To be fair, this is something I should have done while I was... Where's my other spanner? This is something I should have done when I put it all together in the first place, but I didn't know because I'm an idiot and I don't read the manual. Right, that should be good. That is tight. Uh, let's just, while we're here, let's get my precise measuring equipment out again and just do a little check. That's about right. In fact, I think 
through me messing around with it, it actually made the gap more exact there. So, um, let's press the clutch pedal. Well, we have more clutch travel than we did, but it's still got a load of dead travel at the top of the pedal. So, yeah, I don't know what to do now. Not a clue. So I've still got... I can still pull the clutch cable out of the bulkhead. You won't be able to see that, but you can probably hear it. That knocking noise was the, well, more thumping noise, is the clutch pedal going backwards. It's going up to the very top of its travel. And that's realistically where the pedal should start. But it isn't. So, um, here we are. The gap has remained consistent through all that. And the clutch pedal works. And it wasn't perfect before I um, took the engine out. Um, it just feels a little bit worse now, so I don't know whether I'm now misremembering what it was like and it was just like this, but it doesn't feel right. It feels like there's something to do, but I've adjusted everything that can be adjusted. The clutch cable, I can't do anything with because that's automatically adjusting and new old stock ones don't really exist. So it's another used one which has a chance of doing exactly the same thing as this. Plus that's a faff because you've got to get it off the pedal. Um, so the clutch cable is just as it is. I've adjusted down there, this is all set up correctly and the clutch appears to be actuating so I think I'm just going to put it all back together and hope for the best and see what it's like when we go for a drive. While I was getting us started and running again I decided to remove the new air filter. I felt the less combustible material I had close to the carburetor the better. But now that can go back on and just for clarification this is an awful air filter. Don't buy it. You'll notice I've refitted the battery tray and this time I've rooted the wiring beneath it as I should have done the first time. And while we're watching me struggle, as per usual, I thought I'd butt in with something new I've found. I already knew that a few people had the same clutch problem, but I've now cross-referenced the symptoms with three other metros. A Mark II MG Metro 1300, a Mark III Metro Rio, and of course Melvin. And they all do exactly the same thing. So I'm now not worried at all. A characteristic of the model, sir. Peak Austin Rover. So, battery back on, along with the world's most awful clamp, and now we can add the slam panel to keep the radiator in place. I'm making sure to line this up just as it came off the car so the bonnet fits right, and with the grill refitted, she's ready for a proper run up to temperature. With a few pumps of the clutch pedal, any noises go away. She engages in each gear just fine, and we've even got a working radiator fan. We'll have a final little top up of coolant, a check of the oil, and I'll jack up the car to tighten the exhaust clamps. There's a leak at the bottom of the downpipe, but there's not much left to do now. So now it's final checks before the MOT, and the most obvious problem is the lack of a number plate. We also need some Jubilee clips. A few of you may have noticed that there weren't any on this little overflow pipe because I ran out. The rocker cover is leaking a whole bunch of oil and I do have a new gasket but I'll save it for after the MOT. 
Having gone round the car, the passenger side repeater is dead. Not a clue when this happened, but it merely needed a new bulb. And with nothing else I can directly see, time for the bonnet. She's out and she's clean. And now I'm at the end of my list of things to do before an MOT, so MOT time? She's been booked in for tomorrow morning, so I suppose I'll update you then, but here she is, gleaming, perfect, apart from the rust and that wing, which is still full of super glue and this headlamp, which is a bit, that might fail an MOT. But yeah, she's here and she's out and she works. I, I, it's so strange just not having anything left to do. We'll see how it goes, I suppose. It passed. Did you expect anything less? Now, we'll go through this in a second, um, but I just want to say first and foremost that we're not going to go out for a drive today because there are a few issues that really need to be solved before I take you out for a drive. But we have one advisory on the MOT. Passed first time, obviously, but there is one advisory. Nothing to do with anything you and I have done on this car, so that's perfect. That advisory is the steering rack is worn. Now, I'm a little bit surprised that that's shown up on the MOT, but I knew the rack was worn anyway, so I'm not surprised by it. That'll be a job for the future. But interestingly, you can't feel it when you drive the car, but the ride on this car is so solid anyway, it might be deceiving me. Anyway, we'll get to that when it comes. But that MOT was passed and I'm very happy to now the car can go back on the road. We can do what we need to do to it. Um, and everything will be immaculate. The problem that I've come to that we need to address is of my own doing. So you've seen me put a silly air filter on and a silly exhaust on, and the car didn't run perfectly anyway, but now that I've added those things, the tune of the car has gone from being slightly out to now being ridiculously out. So we're gonna have a fiddle with the carburetor before I get it to a professional to have it done properly, um, just to make the car properly drivable <laughs> and then we will um, actually go out for a drive and see what we think. There's loads of stuff still needs doing with this car. The suspension, as I've just mentioned, is one that needs doing, um, but I'm so chuffed to have this car working and back on the road again. It just feels, you know, I've never done a job quite this big before and so to have the car just kind of work um, you know, we've had a few issues, we've hit a few roadblocks throughout it, it's taken me a long time, but um, we've done it, so there we go. This isn't the last video in the series, as I said, there will be one in a couple of weeks where we go through um, more of the niggles, but get the car running properly, and um, that'll be quite in depth, so um, that'll be a good one hopefully, but for now, that's it. We have finished the gearbox rebuild, the car works, and the car has an MOT, so I hope you all enjoyed this little series. Um, if you really have, then please do click like and subscribe to Twin Cam, etc. and share this series because it's not got loads of views. Um, I wasn't expecting it to get loads of views, um, but you know, if you enjoy this kind of stuff, then share it about because I do a variety of different types of content and YouTube doesn't like that algorithmically. It doesn't like doing different kind of things. So, um, so if you share this kind of stuff, then that would mean a lot. I've also got a Patreon, of course. Uh, many of you are already Patreon supporters of mine, but if you would like to, then that'll be in the description. And of course, I'll have more videos coming along soon.